The great outdoors can be very peaceful, but they can also be quite terrifying. Whether you're camping somewhere and get trapped within wildfires like some people recently on the west coast, or you're out there and you run into some supernatural monster. The range of fears out in the woods can seemingly be never-ending. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends. It's good to see that you made it back for another episode. Today, we're going to be sharing some allegedly true and creepy as heck stories sent in by viewers just like you. These stories mainly consist of camping and being out in nature. If you have a camping story or something else that you would like to share in a future video, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. Now, without further ado, let's get into these creepy and allegedly true scary camping stories sent in by viewers just like you. My name is Pamela, but I would prefer to be called Pam. This is one of the many strange, mysterious creatures that I have come across a few years ago here in Michigan, and I cannot quite figure out what this thing is. I hope as you read this somewhat creepy story, you and the other viewers in the audience can help me figure out exactly what it is. Okay, it all started last year when I and a friend of mine were casually walking through the woods late at night near our old school. We were juniors in high school, and we both honestly hated school. Anyways, as I and my friend were going on an adventure late at night, we heard branches breaking in the distance, and something just did not seem right. My friend, who we will call Ross, looks at me with a puzzled look, and asked, What in the hell is that noise? I looked at her with a puzzled look, and just continued to walk on the trail. The trail seemed like it was never ending, and it was almost 3 a.m. I was kind of getting tired, honestly, but luckily, I and my friend Ross had come prepared. We found what looked like an old campsite that had been abandoned for quite some time. We decided to camp out in this area. As we got ready to lay down, we both hear something coming from outside our tent. It sounded like it was getting closer. Pam, what is that? I look at Ross, trying to stay as quiet as possible, as I lay on my back still half asleep. I tell her, It's probably a bear or something. Maybe somebody trying to scare us. Just go back to bed. As she laid there listening to the sound of the strange creature outside our tent, I looked at my watch and realized it was 3.30 a.m., and she is still panicking. Finally, I gave up on sleeping, grabbed my knife, and slowly stood up and looked out my tent. The figure looks like it was in the form of what seemed like a small child. Now, I have heard stories of the black-eyed children as a kid, and was told if I ever came across one while driving, do not allow them to come near you. The creature saw me. I looked at it, and I heard it say what sounded like, Get out! I never let my knife leave my grip. I looked at Ross and told her, Shh, quietly grab all your things and run. I'm going to be right behind you. As we grabbed our things and immediately ran out of the tent, we did not look back behind us. We got about 50 feet away from the tent and we lost sight of the creature. I was honestly terrified by that thing. I really don't know exactly what it was, but to this day, I never went back to that spot in the woods where I had encountered that creature. I swear that this thing still haunts me. Well, Swamp Dweller, I hope you enjoyed my creepy story and can help me figure out what I had encountered. My grandparents own 180 acres in southeastern Ohio, near Wheeling in Moundsville, West Virginia. There have been many Bigfoot sightings in the Ohio Valley, but the ancient burial mounds are what is the most interesting. There have been hundreds of skeletons excavated that are proof that giants existed in the Americas. Recently, my mom's cousin Eddie told me a story about an encounter he had hunting on this exact property. Before the sun rose, he was heading out to his tree stand and was being followed by something walking bipedally. When he stopped, it would stop. 
He said a feeling of dread overtook every other emotion inside of him. Ed changed his route and wrote it off as his mind playing tricks on him. When I was younger, I was hiking near that same location with my good friend Jake. We were accompanied by my black lab Seiko and my grandparents' two blue healers, Shep and Joey. After miles of adventure, we stopped below the grandchildren's treehouse for a breather. After a couple of minutes, we heard a strange noise above us and dropped down a black creature right on top of us. It all happened so fast, but Jake and I took off running and the dogs were squealing and barking at this thing. They surrounded it. At first glance, I thought it was a bear or a panther. For years, I told myself it was a giant feral cat. Recently, Jake said, that thing was as big as Seiko. We made it to the yard and started worrying about the dogs. We could still hear the strange noises from down in the valley, but after a couple of minutes, they finally came running up. They had a look on their face and were acting strange the rest of the night. My grandpa has found large, non-identifiable scats on the property and has had to shoot the gun to save the cattle on multiple occasions. Years later, we were camping in my backyard for a blood moon eclipse. Around 2 a.m., we were laying in the grass enjoying the sky show when we heard some shuffling on the other side of the barn. At first, we thought it was my cats chasing prey, but then realized that they were laying nearby. We figured it must be a deer and went back to gazing at the stars. After just a few more minutes, we could hear rumbling and feel it in our chest. There was a strong reverb from a low growl on the other side of the barn. This was no deer. The cats were spooked too. We got up to investigate but could barely see and only had a stick for protection. We chose to lay back down and accept our fate in our tents. We internally surrendered, but the weird feeling went away after a while and we were back to the skies. When I was about eight years old, my family went camping for several weeks. One day we went into the forest right next to it, and after a while, we found a stone stairway up a small steep hill. It had a red handrail. We went up and found a small trail to follow. At the end of the trail there was a small but beautiful lake and to the left there was an old creepy wooden shed. We spent our day at the lake and had a lot of fun. We told some friends from camping about it, and for the next week, we went there every single day. And even though we had a lot of fun there, there was still a feeling of peace and serenity. Only the shed would give off a creepy feeling. We investigated a bit, but it was too creepy to get too close to. Something just felt off about it. It gave the feeling as if something were watching me. But on the other hand, it felt like it was calling me. It also felt a bit familiar, which only added to the creep factor. Because of the creepiness, we ignored it and enjoyed our stays at the lake. After a week of going there every single day, I asked my parents again if we were going to go to the lake again. Their response was, what lake? I thought they were joking and asked my friends if they were going to the lake they gave me the same response. I asked what we had been doing the past week, and no one seemed to remember. No one remembered a single thing. So I went looking for the lake, went into the forest and found the road that would lead me to the stone stairs. But when I got to the hill, the stairs were gone, and there was no indication of any stairs ever even being there. I climbed the hill, the old-fashioned way, and when I got to the top, there was no trail. Luckily, I walked that trail often enough to know it by heart, so I just started to follow the trail in my head. When I got to the end, I saw something that brought me to tears. The beautiful lake and the shed were gone. The only thing I saw was a field of grass. I went back and never told anyone about it. Years later, still not an adult quite yet, we went to another camp site on the other side of the country. When walking the dog in the nearby forest, I came across a small steep hill with some stairs. I walked up, but my dog, who is lazy, climbed up the hill instead of going on the stairs, which is very uncharacteristic for him. Coming to the top, I found the same trail. I followed the trail, but my dog chose to walk beside it through the bushes, which again was very uncharacteristic for him. And at the end of the trail, I found that the lake had the creepy shed again. 
I immediately went into the water and was happy, but my dog was getting nervous and did not want to get any closer. But the way he moved almost looked like he could not even get closer even if he wanted to. And after just a few minutes, he started barking. My joy had been disturbed and I went to take him home. The next day, the exact same thing happened. The third day, I decided to leave the dog with my family and went to the lake by myself. I came to the small steep hill and again the stairs were gone. I only saw my dog's paw prints on the hill. I climbed up again and there was no trail. I decided to follow it and in the end, the house and the lake were gone. In their place was a fenced off cornfield and when I walked around it, I saw my dog's paw prints directly beside it. Me getting freaked out, I went home and never told anyone. A few years after that when I was about 18, I was supposed to go with some friends on a camping trip, but I could not pull through. So while sitting at home, I got a text from one of my friends. It was the photo of them at a lake. The lake and in the background was that shed. I tried to text him and call him, but they did not reply. After their camping trip is over, I asked them about the picture. What picture? They asked. So I told them about getting a picture of them by a lake, to which they all replied that they did not remember going to a lake. I took my phone to look for the picture, and incredibly enough, it was gone. As a Christian, I am incredibly careful when dealing with these kinds of things, but I could not find a good explanation. When I was 23, I just happened to get to know a few people of the Wicca religion. For those who do not know, it's a witch religion of sorts. I was talking to them, and they asked if I ever encountered paranormal stuff. I told them about a few of my demon encounters, or at least what I thought were demons anyway. They were fascinated by what I said. Then I told them about this moving lake, of which I only have memories. Their faces went pale. They specifically asked me if I ever entered the shed. They asked this with an almost trembling voice. I told them I had not, which caused them to give a slight sigh of relief. I asked them jokingly if they had an explanation for me, and the mood instantly grew tense. They told me they believed that there was several possibilities. One, a witch or a spirit was just pranking me. Two, it's the home of an ancient witch coven that protect their secrecy with mind-altering magic and that they sometimes follow magically powerful people in the hopes to either invite them or kidnap them into their coven, and only those who were magically powerful enough were unaffected by their spell. 3. There is one type of magical creature that gets born human, while its true nature and power lays dormant, and is in some way connected to this kind of place. An extremely dangerous creature that unless trained before awakening could cause a lot of destruction and death. Even uttering the name of the creature could awaken it. The creature is supposed to be one of the only creatures to be immune to magic. Then they told me that they both tried to use spells on me before we talked about this, and all their spells bounced. They told me that there was no one powerful enough within the country to train such a creature, with maybe the exception of that ancient coven. And because of this, they wanted to drop this subject for my own good. 4. The shed could have been the place I have died in in a previous life, and that my soul was trying to figure out what happened back then, and I am thus connected to that place. Honestly, I don't believe in reincarnation, but ever since that talk, I've seen the shed in the lake multiple times in my dreams. I am a heavy dreamer, so this could all be fiction, but the dreams felt like memories, and the shed looked more home-like, you know? I could see people living there in what I believe the early Middle Ages. A happy little family living secluded, only to get attacked by bandits. The father manages to send his wife and children away on horseback while he would stay to fight and hold the bandits up for as long as possible. He killed the mob but got mortally wounded. He tried to go into the shed to patch himself up only to succumb to his wounds. I'm now 24 and some friends of mine are asking if I'd like to go on a camping trip with them next summer. I want to go, but do you guys think I should be scared? This story happened to me when I was just 15 years old, when I was a staff member at my summer camp in upstate New York. The end of summer camp is always a large celebration. We take advantage of no campers being on the property to live it up for the last night of camp. The last is always one of joyous melancholy. 
where you simultaneously have a blast drinking with your best friends in the entire world, but you also know you're about to barely see any of them for another year. During this summer, we replaced a large number of buildings in one of our sub-camps, including the main camp's office building. The last night of camp, we made the biggest bonfire I have ever seen out of the rubble from the office building. The fire was spread across the turnaround point in the center of camp. You couldn't get within 25 feet of the thing without feeling like your clothes would spontaneously burst into flames. The night was fun for the first few hours. People were laughing and drinking and taking pictures, posing in front of the huge bonfire. It was one of the rare times that the three sub-camps got together and socialized with another. I was hanging out with some friends from the main sub-camp. I was from the smaller sub-camp towards the front end of the property, probably a little over a mile away from where we were now. I was offered my first end of summer victory cigar, which we smoked happily as we stretched out on the ground, the cool summer night making the perfect complement to the roaring blaze that burned before us. As the clocks turned to midnight, the staff from my camp were preparing to go. Calls of, to the bus, ripped through the air, and all around me, my fellow staff got up to leave. However, the guys I was hanging out with asked me to come back to a campfire with them for a while before going back to my camp. Having never really had the chance to hang out with these guys during the summer normally, I pleaded and eventually convinced my program director to let me stay for a bit longer, and I would walk back on my own. It took a bit of convincing, but eventually he agreed. The second campfire I went to was a lot of fun, but the only important part happened at the end. I put on my sweatshirt and started my walk back, when one of my friends, we'll call him Dan, put a hand on my shoulder. Hey man, he said slowly, you sure you don't want to stay here tonight? I shook my head, it's not a long walk. I know, but he trailed off into silence. He sounded kind of scared. So I turned back around. I was shocked to see worried faces staring back into mine, their features exaggerated by the light of the flames licking the air around them. I asked them what was wrong. They explained to me that strange things happen to people on the road at night. Tales of ghostly figures seen shimmering on the glass surface of the lake, strange whispering in their ears, footsteps of somebody who was walking directly behind them, but would stop whenever they stopped and vanished when they turned around. As they told me these tales, I felt a chill run down my spine. An increasingly large part of me suddenly wanted to stay here and not go back to my camp. Then it hit me. I was first year staff. It was commonplace for older staff to pull pranks on the younger first years. And scaring the wits out of me, like I was a scared little boy, was one of those pranks. <laughs> I see what you're doing, I said, smiling. The feeling of fear drained out of my body as quickly as they had come but you're not going to scare me that easy. They protested, insisted they were not joking. I was impressed at their level of, you know, dedication. They were really going far to trick me. But at that point, I was not going to be convinced to stay. I wish I had listened to them. The camp road was a thin stretch of groomed gray gravel path. The silvery gray of the road almost seemed to glow in the moonlight, in contrast to the darkness of the gnarled forest on either side. To my left, the forest rose up into one of the mountains that surrounded our camp, and to the right, it dropped off a slight cliff into the thicket of woods and swamp. The walk started off simple enough. I passed the sign to the archery range on my left, the first sign I was leaving the main camp area. Next came the camp turnaround where the fire had been. There were still a few stragglers by the now mostly smoking mountain of wood making sure all the traces of it went out before they went to bed. I waved at them as I passed, but I'm not even sure if they saw me. I did not use a flashlight when I walked around camp normally. I preferred to let my eyes adjust to the darkness. I walked past the turnaround, the road bent to my left, and the last vestiges of light were lost behind me to the endless, inky black of the woods. Pretty much as soon as I left the office fire behind, things started to get strange. Try as I might, I could not get out of my head the stories of my friends telling me all about these ghostly camp adventures. The one that was particularly getting to me was the silent stalker. The spirit who would match your footsteps. If you walked, he would. If you stopped, he would. 
If you turned around to face him, he would be behind you in the opposite direction, and if you run, he would chase you. As I thought about the silent stalker, I could hear the second pair of footsteps behind me. They were close. So close to me they could be breathing down my neck. My body tensed, and I fought to keep my growing fear down. The night was oddly silent. The normal creatures of the night had apparently vanished, replacing the sounds of the woods with an eerie silence. I picked up my pace and my follower picked up the pace behind me. Somehow, as close as the footsteps had seen before, they were even closer now. Any second, I would be snatched and pulled into the forest by some unspeakable horror. Despite myself, I whirled around. There was nobody there. Just the creepy, pearly glow of the road stretched out before me. Very funny, Dan, I called out, my voice echoing off the mountain to my right. Very funny, echoes off the mountain. This is all those second footsteps are. Just echoes off the mountain. Even though I knew it was a lie, it made me feel marginally better. All the same, I decided the silent stalker would have to jog to stay up with me. As I jogged, the lake side of the road came on my right. This made me feel slightly better, as the openness of the lake provided a good deal of light from the moon. It also meant I was more than halfway back to my camp. So close to my bed, and my friends, and away from this creepy dark road. I continued to hear my stalker behind me. I was doing my best to ignore him. But then, something changed. The footsteps behind me vanished and instead I hear the crunch of dead leaves in the woods to my left. I refused to turn towards the sound. I kept my jog as heavy footfalls in the woods to my left continued to keep pace with me. It was an animal. It was an echo. It was somebody trying to scare me. Every excuse in the book that prevented me from facing the truth was whirling around in my mind at once. Screw jogging, I started to sprint now. The thing in the woods kept pace with me, running and running. I just could not outrun it. It was going to get me, whatever it was. As I sprinted, despite my mind screaming to the contrary, I whipped the flash out of my pocket and pointed it towards the woods to my left. There. Larger than life was a man. Or at least, what looked like a man. To this day, I am not sure what it was. He, he was clad in red and black flannel and blue jeans. His torso was faced completely towards me. His huge arms swung from side to side like large pendulums. His face was... wrong. It was splotchy, like it was melting. There were no discernible features, no eyes or nose or lips or anything. But the second I investigated its face, my blood turned to ice. My limbs suddenly failed and turned to jelly. My knees buckled and then I collapsed into the road. The flashlight spinning out of my hand, skidding across the road in front of me. I groaned in pain. I rolled over and felt warm blood from my knees and legs in my hands. Slowly I staggered back to my feet, wincing with the pain in my knees. It was at that moment I felt a slight breeze. The next second I realized I could hear the forest again. The chirping of crickets, the croaking of frogs, the hooting of owls. I did not even realize how quiet the woods had been without these sounds. I scooped up my fallen flashlight and shone it into the woods. The man, or whatever that thing was, had vanished. I asked my friends from the campfire that night before if they had played a trick on me. They swore up and down they did not, and still swear that to this day. I've discovered many secrets of my camp in the past few years but I don't think I will ever know exactly what I saw in the woods that night. My life growing up was far from good. Rather than constant physical abuse, although there was that too, my parents ignored me most of the time. They both had drinking problems. My mom only worked part-time so she could be, as she said, for the kid. But she really spent most of her free time in a bottle or bed. My dad was the main breadwinner, working for an over-the-road truck driving company. He was away most of the time, leaving me alone to take care of myself. Our apartment was at the edge of town, surrounded by miles of forest. If I can remember, I was entranced by those woods. It was not long before I was spending my days exploring them. My love of nature only grew from there. 
I soon realized neither of my parents were paying attention to my comings and goings, so I began camping out in the woods overnight, here and there, just to see if I would be missed, but as I figured, I was not. From there, I began spending weeks at a time camping throughout this vast forest. We all know all good things must end, and one morning, I was caught, walking out of the woods by my father. He had just arrived back from, you know, his time on the road. It was early, and he was livid to see his 12-year-old son walk out of the woods at 5 a.m. on a school day. In addition to hiding, I got an earful from both of them. This did not stop me from returning, though. After laying low at home for around a week, I waited for my dad to leave and my mom to get drunk. When I was sure that she was asleep, I went back to my quote-unquote real home. I would slip back early, early in the morning, prior to school without anyone noticing. It did not take long for things to go back to the way they had been before. If I was not at school, I was roaming the woods. I mentioned before, I had a series of camps throughout the forest. Early on, I realized I was sharing my getaway with others. Among these interlopers were small groups of homeless people. Probably way before I came along, they had used the woods as a place to camp and drink, away from the prying eyes of the police and public. I made the mistake of staying in the same place too long on one occasion and almost got assaulted because of it. After that run-in, I just had to make sure that I moved my camps to the other side of the river. Some nights, I would lurk in the shadows and watch them destroy themselves with drugs and drink. Many times, violence would break out and this only reinforced my hate for them. I already saw enough of that at home anyway. As the months passed, I moved deeper into the vast forest, always looking for a new place to explore. Summer came and with it more homeless people. It was not long before they had little camps all over the woods. However, at that point I was still safe if I stayed on my side. I was the only person who knew where to cross. River or not, my paradise would be taken away from me, once and for all by these very same people. One hot summer afternoon, I was down on the banks getting water, and I heard voices off in the distance. So, I was keeping my eyes peeled. I had retrieved my water, and was returning back to my camp when I heard a group of people arguing on the opposite side. Curious, I hid and watched. There was a raggedy tent set up next to it, three men and one female yelling at each other. They were too far away for me to make out too much of what was being said but they were there for about 10 minutes when one of the other men hit one of these people with a big beer bottle. The man staggered and fell to the ground. I waited for the man on the ground to move, but he didn't. The assailant then picked up a big rock and threw it down on the man while the others just stood by and watched. He did this over and over, about three times until he looked too exhausted to continue. I had to stifle a scream as I watched this horror unfold, and by now, I was much too scared to move. The female then yelled something at the man and slapped him on the chest. He looked unfazed, and instead just stared down at the mess he had just made. After a minute of doing this, the others yelled something again at him, and they all ran away together. I could finally breathe but still dared not move in case they returned. I stayed hidden for what seemed like hours before I decided they were not coming back. I expected the man on the ground to get up, but now... I know how stupid that was. I got the crazy idea in my head that I needed to go help him. Drunk bum or not, he was still a human being. I ran the entire three miles back to our apartment. For some reason, I was happy to see my father was home. I ran in short of breath and began yelling for my parents. I noticed them sitting on the couch together and ran up to them. My dad told me to shut up and then asked what the matter was. I repeated the story of what I had just witnessed in the woods. Rather than getting help, my dad began yelling at me about defying him. My slurring mom soon joined in and they both commenced to chewing me a new butthole. The worst part was, when my mother accused me of making up stories to get attention. I denied this of course, but she was not listening. The rest went the way it always does. My dad pulled off his belt and strapped me across my butt until I began crying and he told me to shut up or he'd give me something to cry about. It was clear to me the discussion was over. The man was not going to get helped, and after all, I was just a stupid kid. I crawled off to my bedroom and cried myself to sleep like I had done so many times before. Honestly, this was one confusing story. 
Eventually, no one really ever asked about this situation again, and we all moved on. As soon as the spring came, I took every opportunity I could to go hiking and explore parks throughout the country. I still visit the same place I saw that guy get killed on a regular basis, and there are still so many amazing adventures I had. I will never forget it though. This confused me, and honestly, still confuses me, why nobody seemingly cared to even check this story out. I don't remember if the police ever really contacted us or contacted anyone or even made a big deal about this. He was just a homeless transient after all. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true camping horror stories. If you enjoyed these stories, please hit that like button, as it helps me add a ton in the YouTube algorithm. If you're new to the swamp, why not join us? Hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications to never miss a new video. I upload them almost every single day, and all things natural and supernatural. Honestly, the story about the silent stalker was my favorite one this time. I'd love to know which story was your favorite tonight please comment down below letting me know that. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future video, whether it's a camping story or something else, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that help keep this channel going. If you're not aware, you can download and listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, and pretty much everywhere else you find podcasts online. If you want to support the channel outside of hitting that like button and subscribing, check out the merch store. I have things from face masks, to shirts, to mugs, to so much more. You can also become a channel member and get exclusive perks very similar to how Patreon works. One last thing before we go. If you all could do me one big favor, and check out me and my fellow narrator, unit number 522's metal band. That would be very, very awesome. We just recently put out our brand new album, and we would love any feedback we can get on it. Thank you guys, as always, for supporting the swamp the way you do. I'll see you guys soon with another creepy video.